All right, I want to start calling this August discussion to order. The constant effort of Silicon Flatirons to use Bob McKenzie's suggestion, expand our frontiers and go where no conference has dared to go before, <laughs> continues. This is exhortation that we would like others to join Bob in, which is how to look at issues from a different angle. There are lots of lenses that keep us thinking about things in fresh, interesting, and engaged ways. Dale Hatfield remains true north as we take this challenge on. One of Dale's exhortations that we may touch on today, we do have an Israeli law professor on the first panel, is comparative and international perspectives. That's certainly a valuable way to see things differently and get new ideas. Another is across different domains where they don't talk to each other. And interesting enough, in the world of property, with a few exceptions like our own property professor Kristen Carpenter or Richard Epstein here for, a lot of people's view of property is real property or black acre. So with any um, exceptions that Richard will bring to his closing talk, that's really not what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about a form of property that gets called different things, generally the phrase common property or a commons. And the question that we have today is how do we develop and govern a commons and what's the role of a commons in whatever the ecosystem that property is acting in. And that is a topic that tends to get obscured. I, on this panel, mostly know about this from the world of unlicensed spectrum where there had been this dichotomy that was commons or property rights. And then what happened was AT&T rolled out the iPhone and realized that unlicensed spectrum saved their bacon. I heard the number from someone from AT&T that today the amount of wireless broadband that is using unlicensed spectrum off of AT&T phones is 75%. So if there was no unlicensed spectrum, AT&T would have a major network management challenge on their hands. They affirmatively embrace the value of the commons as complementing the importance of license spectrum. Last year, in a different conversation, we talked about water. And we'll get to hear Britt Banks moderate a panel on the commons rights, such as it is for water. Uh, for those of you who like to go swimming, go fishing, or any other activities on the water, the idea that there's a public right to access water is controversial, to say the least. And what is important to ask is whether such a right exists, does it happen because the public buys, if you will, an easement and makes that available as a commons? How does that commons get governed? Those issues in water law are very much in play. And third, in intellectual property where we've heard a lot more about this concept because intellectual property has this concept that's unique relative to water and spectrum, which is um, I can use Mickey Mouse as much as I want, it does not necessarily affect your enjoyment of Mickey Mouse, where the water, if we're both in the same water at the same time, it can affect another's right to use it, same with spectrum. And so intellectual property has to ask this question, what are the rights of the public to ideas, either because some ideas are not protectable, an issue that came up in a case involving gene patents recently, or because there's a right of the public, a fair use, if you will, to mock ideas. Uh, Two Live Crew wants to do a version of the song Pretty Woman. They get to do it because it's a parody and a so-called fair use. Um, Ralph Nader wants to make an advertisement about the political system saying a politician who doesn't take money from corporations, priceless. He gets to make that and MasterCard can't sue him. Um, there's lots of tensions and questions about how do you encourage the right to utilize and develop property if it's a commons. Um, those are the questions we'll struggle with throughout the day. And the goal is to learn something from these different domains vis-a-vis -vis one another. And so I don't think there'll be a single person in this room, Richard Epstein accepted, who has deep knowledge across these three areas. Most of us will have one or two that we'll know something about, 
and will be curiously listening to learn from another. And that project of learning, of elevating our thinking, and then applying it into policy is what academic institutions can offer to society. For those who are engaged community members here, we really appreciate your involvement. And Silicon Flatirons is privileged to be working with the Getchus Wilkinson Center. This is where I would hand the microphone over to Britt Banks, the executive director, except his voice is somewhat impaired at this moment. <laughs> so he said, Phil, why don't you save my voice for the panel? And so I'll do that, Britt. And just say a few words about Britt and the center on his behalf. Um, what's great about Britt is the executive director of the Getchus Wilkinson Center is he literally, along with Marilyn Avril is here, grew up in that program. And we're really on the third generation of natural resource leadership here. The first was Clyde Martz, who literally wrote the initial book on natural resources, law, and policy before that field existed. That field then took a second generation. Um, and uh, for those who want a side conversation with Richard Epstein later, he might say a wrong turn in the 70s and 80s, where people like David Getchison, David Getchison and Charles Wilkinson, for whom the center is named, were and continue to be giants. Um, David um, passed away recently, but his legacy and his shadow is still with us. And now we're on the precipice of a third generation. And people like Britt and Marilyn are leaders trying to figure out what new institutions, what new approaches to engaging with the natural resources, energy, and environmental challenges of our times. They just held a conference that held Clyde Smart's name, talking about bottom-up approaches to problem solving, very successful conference um, on the web. They had Mike Connor, the Deputy Interior Secretary here on Tuesday, talking about water management. They'll hold another water management conference here in June. Water policy and the Getchus Wilkinson Center go hand in hand, and there's a lot of exciting work going on. Um, Britt may be able to weave that some into the discussion he'll have. Uh, he's really a great credit to cover the law. And the students who are in the field of natural resources and the students who are in the field of technology don't often get to be in the same room together, but today we will bring them together for a series of conversations. It's my pleasure to tee up the first one, intellectual property. Um, Paul Ohm has become a very accomplished leader here at Silicon Flatirons, having led its privacy initiative, moderated scores of panels. Um, he teaches regularly in intellectual property, uh, writes some in the area in addition to privacy, uh, and he is going to take it over from here. So take it away, Paul. Right. <clears throat> Thank you, Phil. And I wanted to underscore uh, an important theme that we want to put on the table to begin, which is the kind of cross-cutting nature of today's conversation. And you know, the idea here is really um, to kind of scratch the surface, go a little deep when we can, um, but at the end of the day, always have an eye toward the kind of things that bind us together. That's easiest for me to say uh, because we go first. And so um, we're not sure what they're going to say about water and spectrum, but we, we hope to set the table um, and begin to have that exploration. Phil talked about how intellectual property um, really has these kind of subcomponents and really has this background idea of a commons, of kind of this idea that we all share something um, that I think we're going to hear about in Spectrum and Water. And so it's our job, this distinguished panel, to kind of begin to tease out this conversation and throw our mic on the ground and make <laughs> Awful screeching noises along the way. Apologies for that. We have a tradition at Silicon Flatirons. We have many traditions. I'll in, uh, introduce you to others later. Um, but in order to make the most of our time, we dispense with long biographies from the podium. Um, and instead, I commend the biographies uh, that are in your program. Um, but instead, I just want to briefly introduce Cresselia Garcia, my newest colleague on the faculty here at the University of Colorado. Gideon Parkamoski, who's here from University of Pennsylvania Law School. Sabrina Savish, who's a shareholder at Sheridan Ross. And then Steve Van Nerden, who has the distinction of being the only non-lawyer on the panel, um, the president and CEO of Fitzsimmons Redevelopment Authority. Uh, Phil gave us license in his introduction uh, to feel uncomfortable and out of our depth. Uh, so we're going to ask all the law questions of Steve later on. Um, <laughs> but but let, me, let me start with uh, the law professors. Uh, immediately to my left, and I'll start with you, Christelia. Um, and so let's, this is the, our, our kind of opening foray, foray into theory. Um, so intellectual property, I think today we're going to focus mostly on the, the, what I think of as the big three, uh, patent law, copyright law, and trademark law. Um, they all have some notion of a commons, um, that there's some part of it that we don't let you protect under intellectual property. And so uh, you focus on copyright, music, trademark, 
talk a little bit about why we have a commons, when we have a commons, kind of the, some of the theoretical underpinnings of this. Sure. Um, I think you know the the basis of the copyright system, as uh, Professor Ohm alludes to, is that we have we're going to create these. Uh, protections that are uh, ideally designed to incentivize the creators in the case of uh, copyright owners um, or the inventors in the case of patent or the brand developers in the case of trademark um, to incentivize them to create these things and so we're going to give them these limited depending on your point of view pers <laughs> limited protections around around these things and, and some restrictions on exclusivity rights but there's a recognition that the whole point of encouraging these creations, encouraging the creation of new music, for example, or inventions of new, of new patents, uh, inventions, is, is so that the public will benefit from them. So if we keep them under these protections uh, that are too stringent or for too long a period of time, uh, it's difficult for the public to reap the full benefit of them. And so in all of these uh, three big areas of, of, tra of, of intellectual property, although less so in trademark, which is kind of a weird beast, we, where we can actually see indefinite protection, you get this limited period of protection, and then it goes into the commons, which kind of forms the raw materials from which we can all use. And that's why we get things like pride and prejudice and zombies, right? And so uh, for, for better or for worse, the public can now benefit from something that's fallen back into the public domain or the commons, and, and, and we can work with it. But it's, it's also often much more subtle than that, right? And I was just saying before we got here, if, for those who follow this sort of thing, the, um, the big blurred lines uh, decision has come down. We'll, we'll see how, how, how long it lasts. But that idea there is that um, can there be certain things, you know, those who feel this is not a good decision would argue there are certain things that should be in the commons, that should be part of the public domain, because they're just inherent to that particular genre, say. So if you're going to have a, a song that's in sort of the genre of funk, you need to be able to use certain walking bass lines. And that everyone who uses a walking bass line doesn't necessarily need to pay you know, some older or deceased artist for the use of a walking baseline. And, you know, people who study jazz theory would have lots of other examples of that kind of thing. Um, and again, these arguments are that there needs to be uh, this space from which to continue, for people to continue to take the raw materials that they can create from. So we're always trying to strike this balance between enough protection to encourage people to, to get out there and be creative, but not so much protection that it leaves nothing, nothing for us to kind of work from. Yeah, and, and if you're like me and your smartphone has made it so you never read the news anymore, you just read the headlines, um, you're probably not like me. Um, so yesterday a jury in Los Angeles uh, decided that Robin Thicke and uh, Pharrell Williams uh, infringed on Marvin Gaye's song um, and rendered a verdict of $7.3 million. Almost point four, yeah. Yeah, so, um, okay, so Gideon, uh, building on what Cresselia has said, we have this kind of predominant incentive theory of IP. Sure. We give you IP so you go out and create more things. Um, does that adequately explain the public domain? Are there kind of other ways to get at the public domain? It's very, very, very interesting. And first of all, thank you so much for having me here. And, uh, and thank you, Professor Garcia, for um, the things you said. I can definitely follow up. So, so, so just but let, allow me to take a step back. And, and, and you know, th since we're going to talk about um, tangible assets, uh, real property, and then intellectual property spectrum. So um, this choice between you know, common property and private property um, and the literature, the theoretical literature that emerged from it focused, at least in the beginning, on tangible assets. And, and, and the key dimension was use, right? I mean, um, got Garrett Hardin and before him, Harold Demsitz, they all pointed out the problem that if people have the right to use physical assets as much as they want without taking into account the needs of others, uh, it will lead to ruin. Like, we'll have a problem of overuse. Now, why, why is that interesting? That's, that's a natural theoretical reference point for us. But here is where things get interesting. As Professor Garcia pointed out, uh, in the IP space, we don't worry about overuse. I mean, tangi intangible assets, expression cannot be overused. We can all listen. You mentioned the song, so uh, Mar Marvin Gaye. What, 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 what's going on, right? Or uh, something like that. What was the song? It wasn't what's going on. <laughs> it I wasn't so. I, yeah, anyhow, but we can all listen to uh, Marvin Gaye's great music at the same time uh, without diminishing consumption opportunities for others. We can all read uh, the, the, the What? 
Got to give it up. Get a, okay. I thought you were talking about my argument. <laughs> <laughs> which, is a, which is a much better idea. That's great. Excellent <laughs> already. But I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting Thank there. you, Professor Reed, for doing the Google for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and perfect timing. Uh, so, so if we don't have um, rivalrous use or consumption, what, what, what is the problem? So the problem, as Professor Garcia pointed out, is maintaining incentives to create. And that's a very good uh, launching pad for um, what, what I would like to say. So um, for, for, to many of us, I mean, may, maybe not you here in the audience, the, the, the public domain seems like an, almost an anomaly, a residual category, you know, that place that, where we recycle uh, old works, right? After 150 years where we don't have any use for a book or a play or a movie, uh, well, we can park it in the public domain and now everybody is happier, except most of those works are useless by then. I know there are some exam examples that, of works that still have value after 150 years, uh, but that's not what's interesting uh, to my opinion. So, uh, it, so the question is, okay, can we have a different approach? And um, I, I would like to use the time I have here uh, to describe to you perhaps a different vision that uh, Professor Abraham Bell and I are working on that actually doesn't consider the public domain as a residual category as some um, anomaly or exception, but rather we view copyright law as um, a means of allocating rights or allocating uses. And the question then becomes, you know, what uses should be allocated to authors in order to maintain incentives to create? And what other uses should be allocated to the public because we view them as inherently public, as uses that create non-pecuniary non benefits in consumption. And I, I will, if I have time, I will explain to you why we use uses as the basis for our analysis. For, for example, you didn't have to use uses. As Phil uh, said in his introductory remarks, ideas are not protected. So, you could do it based on subject matter. You could have said that musical works are not protected, or uh, movies are not protected, or scientific works are not protected. And, and that's a different approach. And maybe our approach gets in the way of the solution. But we at least feel that um, political speech in matters of factual accuracy or fact finding uh, should be inherently public. They should be considered fair use, except in very extreme cases where, um, where granting them a fair use status would completely destroy incentives to create. But in our world, we don't view it as an exception or as an anomaly. We feel that uh, giving those uses to the public, putting them in the public domain right away, not after 150 years or 180 years if Disney would have it its way, uh, but right from the get-go when works are still valuable, when they are still current and relevant to public culture and whatnot, is the right way to go. Uh, and this should be the right divide, because as long as we maintain enough incentive to create, there's no reason to take more away from the public. Because if I may use just very simple economic language, so um, the marginal benefit to authors is very, very small. The marginal cost to the public is very, very substantial. That's why we believe they should go there. So, so one quick follow-up sure. then. In, in, sure. in the two examples you gave, yeah. Political speech and factual accuracy. I yeah, think. I would love. I would love to get more examples. I mean, we're yeah, looking well, for more. Well, that's my question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My question is: yeah. Is it really narrowly to those two, or what so, about what about humor, or a, or a, what did you call it, a walking baseline? What about like <laughs> like groove or something? I mean, so, how, how far does this go? So, so this is this is yeah. great. But again, uh, the examples uh, that uh, Professor Garcia offered. They're not use related, right? We're, we, here we're talking about certain aspects of the asset, right? I mean, it's a baseline. It's, it's, it's part of the composition. It's several notes. But we don't want it to be so narrow. We don't want to limit it. I mean, that, again, it's a different way to go. Uh, and you can play with it in many, many different ways. You can play with the asset. And since we're dealing with intangible assets, I, no one said that copyright should be defined the way it is defined now, that patents should be uh, uh, sh should have the same scope of rights that they have now. We can easily change it. I mean, 
easily, in theory, I mean, politically, it's, it, it, gets, it gets tricky. Right, right. But guys, I'm not a politician, and I, I don't care about that at all. So, uh, uh, but I, I, I just want to show you the options, and it's, it's for you to decide whether those options are good or bad, and then we can take it to the next level because I will not be part of it. Then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for for students, you may not know this because you're too young, there's this institution called Congress that used to pass laws. <laughs> um, it's, it's ancient history. Right? But, um, so, so Sabrina, you've done a lot of work. You're kind of one of the leaders of the Denver Bar in trademark, um, kind of from all aspects. And when I teach trademark, and I, don't, I know enough trademark to be dangerous, when I teach it to my <laughs> students, I say it's not exactly an incentive theory. The world doesn't need more logos, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that doesn't map perfectly on this copyright and patent story we've been talking about, um, and nor does the public domain necessarily. So, so what are these? How do these two things kind of kick around for you in trademark law? Well, in thinking about this, I decided, and maybe just because trademarks are my favorites, um, that they're very efficient. The thing that's nice about trademarks, unlike patents and copyrights, where you get a defined term, you could agree to put something in the public domain. And it doesn't really matter whether you're using your patented invention or you're using the copyrighted material. The whole theory of trademark law is use it or lose it. And so they're very efficient in the sense that anybody can pick a word out of the dictionary, make up a word, apply it to the sale of goods and services, and sort of claim that property right for themselves. But at the same time, once they stop using it for a certain period of time that works illegal abandonment, it's out there in the public for anybody to reclaim it. And I've probably had 100 clients over the years that say, well, I'm not going to use this anymore, but I certainly don't want anybody else to use it. And that's just not part of the trademark law. And so in some ways, you know, you're right. The incentives are kind of different, but I do think it's a very efficient way, a very efficient property right. You, can't, you can use it up, but you can use it up only for as long as you use it. And there's always there's always the fair use side of things as well so that I certainly can use the word apple to sell apples but I can't use or the generic side of things or I can use apple to compare that my computer is different than an apple computer and then they're also so not everything is taken and to me there's always more out there and things that people stop using get returned to the public domain for someone else to grab so, so, and tell me if this is, to kind of, um, to put that in a frame, it's, it sounds like you're saying the public domain is this enormous book that we call the dictionary. Right. Right? And, and then we have trademark law, which kind of like is the razor blade that cuts certain <laughs> words out of the public domain and then sticks them back in there later sometimes. Right, absolutely. So but, the but then the question is, are we doing, are we striking that balance right? Like, well, there's the dictionary, and really anything you can create that's not in the dictionary. Right. So certainly trademarks are made up words, they're design elements, there's, there's logos. You know, it's really an infinite thing. It's strings of letters that you put together. I mean, you see a lot of trademarks now that certainly are hard to even pronounce. So I kind of look at it, it's really an infinite universe. Uh, that just like it is when you write a book or a story, and and I think that's the tension in, in music. Is there only so many chords and riffs that are out there, or is there an infinite number? There's only so many notes. Um, there's only so many letters, but there's an infinite number of designs. So maybe there's more in the trademark world than anywhere. Kidding, you wanna can, I, can I jump in? I'm, I'm, I'm actually much less sanguine than uh, I, I. I actually I teach trademark law as well, yeah. and I, I see it as much more problematic than copyright law. because say a corporation like Nike can take any word, like we, we talked about priceless, any corporation can take a word that was around for a million years, um, put in an ad, a any um, sports star uh, can, in an interview, throw a line out there and uh, then appropriate it, like, uh, just do it, or... Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Wait, there have been two recent good examples of this, although, yeah, the, the, I forget the second, but so, what was Taylor you know, Swift? And uh, there was Martian Lynch. Martian uh, Lynch yeah. tried to trademark... Right. Didn't try, he trademarked. Yeah, he trademarked uh, yeah. basically the phrase that said, I, I'm only speaking to you because I'm going to get in trouble if I don't. So he has a trademark on that yeah. now. And, and Taylor Swift now has a trademark on this sick beat yeah. and, from her song. And Diamond Dallas Page was able to trademark the diamond uh, uh, finger gesture. And then Jay-Z signaled to his uh, fans after our show, the diamond then got sued by Diamond Dallas Page. <laughs> and I actually think that the world is not endless, that there are only so many combinations that are useful. I mean, uh, in, 
I, I'm much more worried about well, trademark law than I am about copyright law, <laughs> seriously. Uh, but that's, that's just my view. And I teach both right. areas. So, right. uh, well, uh, and, and, and by the way, you're right that eventually they fall into the public domain. But a corporation like Nike that now that we have those retro trends uh, can always, in one of their advertisements, while they're launching the next logo or the next, um, uh, the next slogan, Say, yeah, well, in 1980, we said just do it. Now we say just defend it or just take it or just twin it or just this or that. And that's it. No one else can use it. And with dilution, uh, it gets even worse because um, even similar phrases that convey a similar message may now be blocked. Uh, so mm -hmm. I don't know. That's, 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 <laughs> I, I see the world a little differently. So, so Steve, then, to, to then bring, <laughs> Sorry, in, to bring in the no, one form of IP we really haven't <laughs> talked about much, which is yeah. patent law. Yeah. Uh, and I'm especially interested in kind of from your vantage point as one who worked for uh, Mayo for a long time, mm -hmm. thought a lot about kind of medicine, the rise of personalized medicine, mm -hmm. what doctors do on a daily basis, and how this form of property patent right has kind of wormed its way into that entire practice. What's your idea about this whole conversation we're having about public domain uh, and basically the enclosure of ideas through these little things called patents. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting topic in, in healthcare. Um, and, and I spent my entire career in healthcare, and to, to be honest with you, I struggle with this all the time. Um, no offense to like Taylor Swift or a song or whatever, but <laughs> when you're talking about healthcare, the stakes are a little bit higher. <laughs> and so when you look at what we're trying to do in healthcare, I've looked at probably 4,000 technologies in my career. And every time when you look at to, to file a patent or not, there's this kind of struggle with inside of me personally is in medicine, it first should be for the benefit of all of us. And so shouldn't we just get this out there and let the world practice medicine? And then you very quickly realize that if you don't file a patent on that, nobody will invest in it and the idea will go nowhere. And so we struggle with this every single day on do you get this technology out there? And there's a spectrum of what I've learned over, over the years. One patent in medicine can be very, very valuable, not typically in, in computers or other things. There has to take a, a whole group of patents. But one patent can be very valuable. And it can be to the benefit. So um, Mayo invented, when I was at the Mayo Clinic, not when I was there, but they invented cortisone. Mm -hmm. And so without the patentability of cortisone, uh, Merck would have never taken that on and we would have not benefited from cortisone, of which Mayo won the Nobel Prize for. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would have been stuffed away in some place that, that didn't get to. All the way up to the other spectrum, where uh, we were involved in the, uh, a, a US Supreme Court case called the Mayo Clinic versus Prometheus. Mm -hmm. And in that particular case, it had gone way to the other extreme. And it's a very complicated case, but to the, it's simply what Prometheus wanted to do, and this, this is just an analogy, they wanted to patent 120 over 80 for blood pressure. And so if the doctor was going to use 120 over 80 to determine if you should get a blood pressure medicine or not, Prometheus would sue you, that that, that was their patent and that you should not be able to do that. And so you can see how in medicine, how, state, how high those stakes are, that they could halt the advancement of medicine that would benefit all of us but yet, if you don't patent things, they may never see the light of day because nobody will be willing to invest in them. And we, there, there's a constant struggle with that. And I never quite got over it. Um, yeah, no, no. I mean, yeah, so this is too intriguing. So I have to ask you the follow-up, right? So, so as one who lived through both of those episodes for yeah. the same company on the opposite sides of the patent question, mm -hmm. I mean, can you really strike that balance? I mean, is it consistent? to say, yes, we absolutely own cortisone, and then as a defendant a decade or two later to say, but you do not own 180 over 20 or 120 over 80. I right. mean, how, how do you square that? That, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a you, difficult you, line drawing at the very least. It really is. How do you mean? In one case, it helps him, in the other case, it I doesn't. know, it could, it, it could just be that. And there's the line. <laughs> <laughs> I found it. Simple. The, only, the only true north, and, and then that's, a, again, I still struggle with that every time we've looked to file a patent. Yeah. knowing that this could benefit me or a loved one someday, and what do you do? Yeah. And the only true north aspect of that is, is this going to benefit patients? And what is the best thing for the patient? And if you focus on the end user, which is the patient, which is all of us, 
and you try and keep a perspective on what is the route that you would take to benefit patients and take the leap of faith that the rest will work its way out. That's the only true north aspect of, of medicine when you're looking at this that, that, that I've been able to determine that I could sleep at night. Okay. Can, I, can I follow up, if I may? So I, I actually thought that your answer would be a little different, if mm -hmm. I may. I, I, I thought that, you know, in the case of cortisone, a lot of money went into R&D, and it's not something that you would have discovered um, just uh, per chance or surreptitiously or something like that. Whereas the, many, uh, many of my friends are doctors, and th they come up with so many innovative procedures and diagnostic tools or uh, marks, mm -hmm. just it, it's a side effect of, of you know, doing things. It's, it's, the same way you don't need to incentivize, uh, give academics, uh, say, I don't think patents or even copyrights to have us produce work. It's, it's what we do. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's a byproduct of, of, of our lives. So I, I, that this, I, I don't think that this line is, is a practical line, but I think it's, it's probably you know, more, it's more consistent with this view that we want to maintain incentives to invent rather than just reward people for giving us uh, good things? Yeah, it's, that's an interesting question, and, and um, I've seen the spectrum all over the board. Um, I've seen physicians come to me with a really good idea, and when they say, you know, Steve, it really isn't about the money, mm -hmm. it almost is always about the money. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's no, you know, physicians, although they, they first get into medicine to say, you know, I want to I wanna do good in the world, then the healthcare system kicks in. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you know, 10 or 15 years later on why they went into med school and why they're there today is a completely different thing. And the system kicks in to, to do that. And so I don't think it's inherent to um, where they're practicing medicine and what they're doing to say, yeah, that, that's part of my job to invent. Um, when you've got nine minutes per patient and you're trying to just get through the day and you're trying to develop these things and you've got, you know, Four, four, four hours of paperwork after that and you dictation and this whole thing called electronic medical record is, is confusing to people. My physician can't type worth crap and so they're hunting and pecking away for things and developing the system. You lose sight of the ability to be able to say, you know, really what I'm here to do is, is to bend the curve of medicine. So I, I had two, two reactions to that very quickly. I, first, I think that Nine minutes per patient is a great name for a horror movie. Uh, and then the second reaction, which may be a little more relevant. Can I copyright that? <laughs> yeah, you uh, trademark, maybe. Uh, uh, yeah. Not clear. I mean, books trademark. and movies. That used to be in the public domain, now Gideon knows it. Yeah, yeah. But, but the, se the second reaction is, is this, so, you know, is it, isn't it, so the entire analysis of your expectations, aren't they formed by the legal baseline? So in, in a world with patents where everything is patentable, if you don't patent, uh, you're an odd guy, right? People will look at you and say, and, and then this thought creeps in and you think, wow, I mean, <laughs> I'm not supposed to do good for free. I'm supposed to be rewarded for what I'm doing. I'm supposed to get some exclusivity, some rights. I mean, why would Merck or Mayo get uh, a patent I, and I won't? But uh, if there was an exclusion, the, the baseline, under a different baseline, do you think that it would change uh, physicians' behavior, maybe? If they didn't have this expectation of protection for 20 years, um, they would treat it differently. They will not be as. I think it would, and and you're starting to see this blurred line now today with uh, with personalized medicine and computerized medicine. Now now computers are running into doctors, so you know matching docs with geeks, mm -hmm. and it really changes mm -hmm. that perspective because the computer industry is. A, from a patent standpoint is way different than the healthcare industry. But now with bioinformatics and big data and personalized medicine, you're really starting to, to your point, you're really starting to see the lines blurred and associated with that. And so you may put out in the public domain and open source um, algorithms for, for, for software programs in, in healthcare, but that's going to lead to additional patents. And so it's an interesting dynamic when you start to see the blurring of computers with medicine. So th that getting your follow-up was the yeah. perfect segue because so we've kind of put the IP on the table, the forms, we've talked a little bit in academic ways about incentive theory. 
let's focus on one or two specific rules from different forms of IP and how they kind of set the size of the public domain, the existence of the public domain. And you know, we could talk about the two forms of fair use, but they're awfully esoteric. So here's a really nuts and bolts one. Gideon's already invoked it a couple of times. Duration. So patents last from, for 20 years from the time you file it, and then in some sense that invention goes into the public domain. Uh, copyright lasts from if it's invented by a person, uh, created by a person and not um, an institution, the life of that person plus 70 years. And a trademark could live forever, mm -hmm. although Sabrina started by saying a lot of them don't, mm -hmm. right? So how do we turn this big knob, this big duration knob, mm -hmm. what role does our kind of beliefs about the public domain play, and have we done a good job with any of these three examples? So Christelia, maybe we start with you and think about, and, and of course in copyright, you then have to talk about uh, Mickey Mouse and the fact that it used to be life plus 50, <laughs> and right when Steamboat Willie was about to expire, I think it was totally unrelated, just a coincidence. Totally unrelated. Congress made it life plus. You know, there was a predecessor. There was a rabbit, and they couldn't use it. That's why they switched to a mouse. Yes, I think that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so did we do a good job? Is life plus 70 the right balance that Gideon was talking about earlier? Yeah, you know, th th this is the struggle. And, and uh, for anyone who follows copyright, even tangentially, it, it'll come as no surprise that it's hotly contested as to whether this, this period of time is, depending on who you ask, either too long or too short. I think the reality is we don't know, but I think in terms of balancing with the protection that's actually incentivizing uh, artists to create versus balancing what is incentivizing, you know, kind of borrowing from patent investors to invest and this sort of thing are, are really two different issues and it depends on which question you're trying to answer. Are you going to motivate someone to create Mickey Mouse or motivate someone to invest in a new Mickey Mouse movie are perhaps two different things and they can both fall under copyright but I think now we're talking two different animals. Um, same animal, but different. same animal, but two <laughs> two different mo yeah, two different mouse. Yeah. beings um, who who can be motivated in, in sort of different perspectives, um, and so I think we end up with this this uh, these concepts, which I know we'll be getting to things like fair use as a means of um, um, skirting or circumventing this duration in, in any in any instance, uh, whether we're talking about copyright, trademark, um, or patent, so that we say well. Um, you know, to the extent that we, you know, this duration is a bit long, or, or we've got it wrong, or it, it's just inconvenient in this particular aspect and might deter creation in some other way, uh, will allow some use of it for some of the things that you know, Gideon went through and, and other uses as well. So maybe things like fair use, which we'll get into, are, are ways that we try to check for these things when we don't quite have them have them right. So, you know, is my long-winded answer of saying. I, you know, I don't know if this is right. I suspect in many cases, you know, life plus 70 years is a bit long. Um, Mickey Mouse being the quintessential example of that. Like, when, when will this ever end? Um, but that said, there are a lot of ways in which people use content uh, well before it falls into the public domain, too, borrowing concepts and borrowing ideas, because after all, we're copywriting expressions and not ideas, right? So uh, anyone can write a you know, series of young adult novels that involve vampires and romance, right? You have to change the characters and, and so forth. But the idea of having a teenage romance involving vampires, people can still run with that. So just to put a finer point on it, because whenever I teach the copyright term extension act, I always say, because some novelist is going to wake up one morning and say, it used to only be my grandkids who are going to get any of this money, but now my great grandkids will forget it. I'm not going to do that other thing I could do today. I'm going to sit and write, you know, and I say that and the class laughs. Okay. But I think what you're suggesting is it might be a little more rational and easy to understand if we focus on the big the big industry, right? Right. I mean, maybe they actually do have some spreadsheet that says 20 years for the biggest hits mm -hmm. equals this many millions of dollars, especially if we compound it, you know, over that entire time. It's possible. I mean, yeah. speaking only for the industry I know most about, which is music, I, 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 I'd be skeptical. Where 18 okay. months is the far end of like right. milking something from, from a particular song. That was right? until yesterday's jury verdict. <laughs> until right. <laughs> right, right, until right. yesterday's jury verdict, <laughs> right. which might indeed change the entire calculus. But otherwise, I would say, you know, it used to be that the horizon for milking everything you could out of a particular song was, you know, nine to 18 months on the far end. So, so then, only as to music, I would say, st still a bit long, even I'm, on the investment side. I'm going to jump to See if he's had his yeah. hand up. I mean, 20 years, is that something you think about in, in kind of well, your industry? So I'm going to use this advantage here to ask my lawyer friends. <laughs> I'm not one. Um, so in the healthcare industry, the 20 years has been 
phenomenal benefit to that. There are drugs that are available today that patients can afford that they would never be able to afford if you had, what is it, life plus 50, 50 years, years, some 70. kind of, 70 years. Yeah. So, you know, hold, the whole generic industry uh, spawned. Patients have benefited wildly from that limited use kinds of things, but yet it's still long enough for, you know, big players to put a lot of money in investment. It costs a billion dollars now to develop a drug. And so you want that exclusivity, but then you let the rest of the world benefit that. What you guys talk about is crazy in my <laughs> world. Why, why is it that long? Why, why not at some point in time go, you know, get on with life and let's create some new things and not have to worry about getting sued from, from you know, Marvin Gaye's estate? Um, I, that, that's just crazy to me. So why is it that way? Why can't it be more like medicine? Get, get anyone in. So it them. is crazy, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and way too long, but I think that we're thinking about it in the wrong way. The problem is not the length, it's part of the problem, but it's, it's the fact that we decided to go with a one size uh, fits all system. I mean, there's no logical explanation for that. I mean, it, it, in, in Mickey Mouse, if I may, so I teach the same class, and I, I finish with a different conclusion. I think that the world would have been better off if Mickey Mouse could be protected, just Mickey Mouse in perpetuity, and Disney would let go of yeah. all the other works and just have Mickey Mouse all for itself. Now, Mickey Mouse is really weird, though, by the way, if you think about it, because Mickey Mouse is trademarked, and mm -hmm. trademarks uh, last forever. So yeah. for this little delta that it gets uh, you know, to, to protect Mickey Mouse against uh, non-commercial use, Disney was willing to go to such great lengths. And, the, the story about the rabbit and the mouse in 1927, they had... Was it Oswald? Oswald, exactly. Oswald the, Oswald Oswald the yeah. rabbit. And yeah. when Disney could not, Disney, uh, the, the man, could not use it, he switched to Mickey Mouse. And really, in our world, uh, with children being so influenced by Disney, they can come up with a Gideon cartoon, and it will do as well, <laughs> I think. So uh, I actually think that, so to be, to be serious, medical inventions should get maybe even more than 20 years. No, not, not much more, 21, not more than 21, but 20 years may make sense there, but for many other inventions. Now, most copyright works have no value after a few years. Uh, slogans, uh, pardon me, Sabrina, should not be protected in my world for more than one year. I'm serious, never more than Oh, one really? Year. That's yeah. fascinating. In my world. But, uh, and, and, and by the way, you know, in a different project with Abram Bell, we offered um, modular protection where inventors and artists can choose the terms of their protection, except you get a menu. You can choose what rights you want for how long with certain caps, but it will cost you. So the more protection you want, you'll have to pay. You don't get 120 years just for right. free. You get a certain minimal protection for free, and then you decide how much you want to buy. And that, I think, would reflect the cost to society of having such uh, long uh, protections as we have right now. But yeah, for slogans, I'm serious. One oh, so then let's let Three. give Serena the right of reply. But be, before you answer the second question, the second, the, the real question, which is, is that a good idea or why not? Right. Mm -hmm. I want to hear the first answer, which is, so, so what happens to your advice to your clients, right? So these trademarks now last for one year because Gideon is king. Right. Right. I mean, <laughs> how, how disruptive is this? And I guess that'll lead right into, is this a good idea or is this not? Can, can I, can I ask? So just, just. <laughs> you can all no, 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 no. Right? But in the fashion world, we have no, no protection at all. So you right. get so much innovation. Not, Nike can use any slogan under the sun. But you and, just and mean slogans? What, what about just slogans, yeah. Oh, not the trademarks. No. Not the no, no, logos. No, 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 no. I'm not depriving Nike of the swoosh. Oh. But Marshawn Lynch would, you know, get protection okay. for one year. Yeah, yeah. And that's it. All right, less and radical than I thought you were. He can run the ball if his coach lets him. Uh. <laughs> well, one of the things I think on trademarks that you have to keep in mind is some of the motivations are different. The theory of trademark law is to protect the public against confusingly similar products. And so it's not as, to me, the basis is certainly they're inventive and creative and they help people commercialize their products and own you know, a, a brand applied to their products, which are very valuable. I mean, companies like Coca-Cola without the brand name is the company. It's not like there isn't oh, other right. caramel colored things in the cans. <laughs> so what I would say with that is that the, the, there's kind of a competing interest and we want consumers to, exp to know that they're gonna get a certain level of quality. And that sort of, to me, makes sense with you know, protection going on forever as long as you're producing the product and selling it and people are looking for that quality product from you. And certainly trademarks can damage, I mean, their quality can go down. When there's an oil spill, 
you know, by BP, that the value of that trademark is, is sinking. And some people can recover from that and some people can't. So then on the idea of slogans, and slogans are a little bit different because I would say in my world, they kind of come and go. And so, you know, just do it has stuck around a long time. But, you know, McDonald's has had in my lifetime a lot of different slogans. And so I think in reality, maybe the world sort of matches what Gideon wants in the sense that they don't stick around for, you know, 30 years in most cases, that people reinvent themselves, they let something old go, and somebody else picks up a slogan that's kind of similar. And then there's also the other idea that how close can you get? There are a lot of just blanket slogans out there. And you, so, I'm loving it. It's crazy. I'm loving it. I go, <laughs> I, 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 but does Burger King have to say I'm loving it? No, not Burger King, but any restaurant now under the sun, any cafe cannot say I'm loving it or I'm loving the, I'm loving the food we serve, I'm loving our customers. That, that would be an infringement. Why? I mean, it's, well, I don't I mean, wouldn't that be a, if a well, fair why use? Why do we need to protect it? Well, in, in the trademark I mean, world now? So one thing no. Sabrina put on the table no, is... No, not, 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 not for a business. I'm loving it now. It's not, it's not traditional fair use and it's not nominative fair use. No. So Sabrina put on the table, though, that trademark does have this kind of unfair competition or maybe even consumer protection angle to it. But I'm not that against... it would be a bad not, thing if someone wandered into a restaurant that had I'm loving it on the front. I'm not against protecting brands, uh, yeah. again, but should we protect also the colors, the design, the this and the that? These are all... So again, if, if you look at it from an economic perspective, with every dimension you add, you get diminishing returns for the trademark owner and the, 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 the anti-competitive effects increase all the time. So what are we doing here? I mean, we're, we're just following a certain instinct without ever testing it, um, why? So, so by the way, I should have said, and, I'm, and I hope you understood that in about eight and a half minutes, I'm gonna um, go to the audience for questions as well. Um, and so what, the next question I, I then wanna ask is, uh, I think it is our duty to, to peek ahead a little bit to water and spectrum, <laughs> and to talk about some things that may be different about our very specific form of property we're talking about here. Um, and so Phil already put one on the table, which is what, you know, law professors call rivalrousness. Um, you can enjoy this weird type of property and it doesn't diminish another person's enjoyment of it. And I know a few of you have talked about it. I'd like to hear a little bit more about what you think of that. Let, let me put one, uh, one other one on the table. Um, these are all essentially man-made things, right? They don't pre-exist human initiative, creativity, energy, work, time. Um, that I think, I know is unlike water, although won't I be surprised if someone tells me I'm wrong about that. Um, and I think it's unlike spectrum, although I imagine Pierre, who's the smartest man I know, is gonna come up with some elaborate theory where, where that's not true. What does that matter, right? I mean, I, I guess it speaks to infiniteness almost, you know, that, that this is all kind of human creation. So this is more of a jump ball for anyone who wants to take this fragmentary thought and run with it. How are these things important? to what we consider the public domain or the commons in intellectual property. I've stunned you. <laughs> well, one of the things in, in medicine that, that's interesting is end of life. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so uh, do you, are you denied because the, the largest healthcare costs are in your last two years of life. Mm -hmm. And so a tremendous amount of expenses cost there that in the United States is treated very differently than the rest of the world. And so is it that you get all of the benefits to ma modern medicine at the end of life, or is there some way that that should be limited? And I think of it in a weird way to water, uh, but uh, it's, it's a limited resource that you are controlling or a limited resource that you are, yeah. are uh, and, and it's an interesting debate about in well, healthcare and, end of life. And, and so let me run with this. I mean, I could also, and again, what I don't know about spectrum and water is scary, but I can imagine one thing end of life makes me think of is kind of the need for a robust public domain may ebb and flow over time, right? And in, in your case, over the life cycle of one human being, right? right? I imagine that's true for water in times of drought. I imagine that's true for yeah. spectrum in times of 911 emergencies, right? And so, so okay, good. So maybe there's, there's one. Gideon and then Christelle. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's go first. Oh, well, let's I, I was just going to, to kind of grab onto this concept of renewability and the one little other bit that I sort of kind of know something about, which is water, right? So water being um, a more a, a limited resource in the way that most intellectual property is not, but it is renewable, right? So, or the idea that, you know, 
you may dry up a lake, but then it will rain and then you'll have more water. And I think in some sense that is what uh, we try to do in intellectual property by maintaining a public domain is a sort of renewability of ideas, things that trademarks or slogans that people are not using can fall back in, patents that have run their course can fall back in, and then we can get generic medicines. Um, likewise, although in a much longer time frame, um, you know, expressions of ideas from copyright can fall back into the public domain and be zombified. And so I think this is sort of an attempt by IP to recreate this renewability aspect that we can see in some of these other areas. Yeah. So just very, very briefly, so water, as some of my colleagues pointed out, I mean, there are two differences. Uh, you, as you said, there's rivalrous consumption, and the, the, the other part is that it's a finite resource. And uh, what, wh where I see some similarities is that it's, it's hard to define the asset. Like, we all know what the river is, but uh, what, how much of it is yours, that's, that's a different problem. And uh, the, the trick with, with water, I think, is to establish the right rules for use and consumption. And because the resource is, 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 is well, it's so difficult to define and it's difficult to monitor use, uh, that's, where, that's where the problem is. I think it's a very different problem than the one we have now. Although there are, again, some similarities because also in the case of IP, infringements are often difficult to detect and it's, it's, it's hard to sue. But um, I, I think water presents a different set of problems because it's fundamentally different. It, 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 is, it is prone to overuse and to, to destruction. Even if it's renewable, I mean, the entire ecosystem that depends on it is not, cannot be so easily renewed, not, not in the case of large rivers and bodies of water and lakes, I think. So we have to be more careful there. So, so all of these comments make me think of one good counter argument that we don't think of as kind of a form of IP, although it's related to trademark. And that's the domain name system, right? So we have these domain names, and the ones that end <clears throat> with .com are seen as kind of a finite resource because there's only so many words. Mm -hmm. And it's especially finite when you realize there's only so many good words. Mm -hmm. As you pointed out earlier, Sabrina, we leave vowels off all the time now because that's all we can get. Right. But here we are at this interesting moment where... But there's Google now. I can. Well, <laughs> there's Google, so maybe we don't need domain names. Yeah. But I can in the last couple of... Uh, ye last year... I said, okay, we're going to blow the lid off this thing. Mm -hmm. We're going to go from .com, .org, and 14 others, and a bunch of country ones, to an infinite number. Um, and so you've all started to see, you know. That horse. That right. horse, right. yeah. <laughs> right. I said, <laughs> like, well, um, that there are all of these right. examples. Um, dot, dot .app is one that Google is going to pay millions of dollars to own, the entire dot .app uh, domain. Wouldn't that be great if they could do that in water? They're like, I'm going to wave a wand, I'm a government agency, and I'm just going to create, you know, a thousand times more water in the world, right? The domain name system to me is more like real property. I mean, there's only so many street addresses, yeah. and the dot-coms are more desirable, and the one-word dot-coms are their most desirable. Maybe that's the lakefront property. Right. And then now they have a million of these other, you know, GTLDs that are dot horses and dot somethings that nobody really likes. And, you know, it's going to take a while for all of us to get used to them. So in that sense, you know, domain names really are a different animal because only one person can have that address. And, you know, the, the, it's not infinite um, in some sense, but it'll take a long time before we use them all up. Yeah. But, I mean, unlike real property, like I said, you could create new lakefronts mm -hmm. overnight. Um, I, I'm not sure that analogy kind of maps onto that, right? And maybe it does. I mean, analogy is, is the name of what we do. So. Right. Um, any other thoughts on domain name system? All right. I, I think it's a problem from the 90s. It's no longer an issue to me anymore. Really? That, seriously, does anyone here in this room have a problem finding anything on the internet? I mean, because, because, of the, of because of the domain names? Because of Google. No, I mean because of the domain names. Because you, yeah, yeah. Does anyone type domain names? <laughs> oh. I had, I had yeah, a, you do? <laughs> God I, bless you. I, I, I just type all IP addresses. I don't believe in domain names. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Same. So, so here's my last question. Then we'll go I, give up, I give up. I, I, have, I have lots of other questions, but here's my last one. And before we go to the audience, um, one other thing that I think actually may hold in common across the entire day is the role of technology in influencing the public domain. Um, and focusing where we're expert on intellectual property, I think it's really fair to say that in every one of our fields, technology has either expanded or contracted the public domain 
sometimes at the same time. Um, so, so let's talk about like kind of today's condition with the big fights we're having about the public domain. What has technology done? And I'll start on the other end, Steve. What, how has technology influenced what we consider in common versus protected by patent, for example, in the health industry? Yeah, so personalized medicine or individualized medicine is, is, is going to be, if you look out where we're at today, I, I think we're just finding the cr first corner piece on the puzzle. Uh, it, it is going to explode in the next 20 years on personalized medicine, which, you know, you can, you can do uh, an analysis of your whole genome now by swabbing the inside of your mouth and sending it in to 23andMe, and they'll sequence your whole genome for $400, and it'll give you all of this information. And so what's really going to be interesting is, is that information going to be turned into knowledge, either for me or against me, and who owns it? Who owns, who owns that? Is, that? is it me that owns that? Well, if I own it personally, it's not very valuable in personalized medicine because mine should be compared to a million other people so they can tell me, you know, here's how you compare to other people. But now you're taking my information and you're going to have to compare it to somebody else's information in order to make it valuable. And I think that's going to bring up a whole host of issues in the law over the next 20 years associated with data being turned in, into knowledge. And that technology of genome sequencing is, is just going to go crazy in the next 20 years. And then after that's going to be proteomics, which is what changes over time. Genomics doesn't change much over time. Proteomics changes over time. And you're going to see a whole host of things that are going to go on that is going to challenge the legal system. And of course, Nat, you know, part of your answer is all about privacy, which is my wheelhouse, but I'm going to resist the temptation to go down that road. Let's, let's talk during the breaks about that. Hey, so, don't get me started on that. Yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah. we could have a whole other comment on that. <laughs> yeah. uh, so Sabrina, and we've touched on the, the domain name system. Maybe yeah. that's the best example, but Google but, might be another example. I mean, well, The other thing, and Gideon brought this up, it's, it's sort of the limits of what your trade, the scope of your trademark rights. So we, we know we can live with Delta faucets and Delta Airlines. Can we live with Delta luggage? Is that too close to Delta Airlines? Yeah. And that really affects the size of the public domain, what's left for other people to use. And what's happened with technology, and maybe it's not really technology, it's just the world today, now that we live with technology, is there are so many more businesses. There's so many more online sellers. It is so crowded out there. It is easy to set up a storefront and have customers and start using a trademark. So the public domain has shrunk mm. as a result of technology. Or complexity or put some mm -hmm. other word on it. That's really interesting. Gideon, thoughts on this so, question? So two, two things. I mean, uh, really, the first one is just something that I have in the back of my mind. And maybe uh, this is hopefully my concluding remark. So uh, the, when we talk about technology, one, one interesting development is uh, 3D printers. And there's the great movie, uh, Print the Legend. I, I can see that some people are smiling. Uh, which What's it called? Print the Legend. It's about the race to uh, produce uh, the, the best uh, 3D printer. And uh, very, very interesting. Those who want to learn anything about you know, the, the world of startups and how demanding and cruel it is, uh, it's, it's, it's a great movie. But, but that, that, of course, uh, now implicates a lot of people in potential IP infringements, because if in the past, you know, the world of technology was pretty much um, out of our reach, nowadays we can print at home any patented products uh, and applications and whatnot. But the, the, the real point I, that I, I wanted to make, the second one, and that's, that's perhaps a counterpoint, is that uh, technology, by creating more opportunities for cooperation, also works to increase the public domain. So I, I'm thinking about the open source movement, about various collaborative uh, enterprises that involve people who in the past didn't have, as individuals, the resources to produce those works because they, they require either um, significant amounts of money or cooperating with other people as, as an enterprise. And now, now we can do that. So that's, that's interesting, too. And I, I see many phenomena that did not exist in the past. And, and thanks to the fact that technology reduces transaction costs, cooperation costs, monitoring costs uh, are now feasible. So what I really like about a lot of these answers is it's not really just technology. Technology as a substrate 
on yeah, which we build just technology, kind think, of yeah. social constructs, different types of relationships, different types of businesses. So let's tie that, then tie it to copyright. So I mean, pick your technology, right? There's DRM, there's YouTube, there's right. the internet, there's. I mean, these things have had a dramatic impact on copyright in particular. Yeah, I, I perhaps in no other area of IP, although I don't patent to some extent, but you know, copyright has been ch has been challenged. Uh, or provided opportunities, depending how you look at it, by technology um, um, a lot in the last couple of years in particular, in the last five years, in the last ten years, in, in different iterations. I think that at the same time that technology has uh, allowed for um, a bit of, we had a panelist last week talking about the democratization of, of sort of creation, you know, it's much easier to be a filmmaker, anyone can sort of write up an ebook. it doesn't, we're not talking about quality, we're just talking about production here. Um, so in some ways it's, it's, it's helped to increase content, um, you know, moves like, you know, creative commons, people can write their ebooks and post them up on fan fiction websites and so forth and put any sort of rights around them. The interesting thing for, for, for me, what technology has done to copyright, is really confuse the law around it. Because the Copyright Act of 1976 is not equipped to deal with all of the technology that we have now. It doesn't, it doesn't account for it. It didn't predict it. It can't respond to it very nimbly or very flexibly. Um, and so we're left in this, in this state where people are kind of feeling their way around. We've been taught, we talked, we alluded to the Blurred Lines case. And I think um, what it kind of, it, it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, uh, some people may not bother at all because they just can't figure out what they're allowed to use or not use, and that's not good for the public domain. Um, uh, in some ways, uh, this you know, people have written about this, like Jim Gibson, about this rights accretion where people are constantly asking for permission to use things they didn't need to be asking for permission to use in the first place. And so we see copyright kind of going off in both directions, and neither of those are good for the production of the public domain. So, uh, you know, technology giveth and, and technology taketh away, I think, is, is the, the overarching uh, thought I have on that vis-a-vis -vis copyright. Great. So we have about nine minutes left. Um, the, the very few students in the room know what I'm going to say next. Uh, at Silicon Flatirons, we have a tradition called the wiser role in honor of our dean. Uh, the first question of every panel should be asked by a student. Uh, the two students I see are looking at one another right now. Um, <laughs> g given, given the number of students, I'll give you a minute to think of a really good question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, and please wait for the mic. This is being recorded and streamed. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. My name is Austin Gaddis, and I am a 2L here at Colorado Law. My question is to follow up a little bit uh, on something that Professor Garcia said uh, right, right at the very end. You said that the public doesn't know really what they should be doing. You know, so how, how do we how do we educate the public in in a way in, a, in about a topic that at times can be very complex? You know, how do we, as attorneys and in, in, in as actors in this space, how do we make copyright and, and trademark law accessible and, uh, and understandable to the general public? Well, that's a, that's a great question. And, and you know, if, if the entire, this entire time we keep using the word public domain, mm -hmm. right? So I think tied up in Austin's question is, d does the public have to understand public domain? Do they understand public domain? Like, are they really part of this or is that just the label we give to this, right? And does it differ with copyright, trademark, and patent? It might. Right. Yeah, I think so. I mean, and this is sort of a, ch a cheater answer to your question because it doesn't actually answer the question of how do we educate. But I think one uh, solution to the difficulty in educating the public on something that's so convoluted and, and frankly, you know, we don't know the answers in many cases um, is to, uh, as advocates, to make moves towards simplifying the laws. Um, you know, they should be something that creators and the public can understand. Not every nuance, not everyone has to be, has legal training, but they should be able to, you know, have a general grasp of what they can and can't do. You know, fair use, I think, should be a more intuitive concept. It shouldn't be such a thing where you have to hire counsel to figure out whether you, you can do something in all, in all moves. And I think there are moves on both sides to try to simplify um, the rules in the application. So that may be, uh, uh, you know, in terms of effectiveness, that may be the most effective move um, towards helping to make this more accessible. So um, just very, very briefly, it's a great question. And, uh, I actually think that the best way to go is to mark the works that are not protected. Uh, Creative Commons people are doing that. Because if you mark the works that are protected, there are enough people there who would work very, very hard to remove the markings and the notices and whatnot. But if you, it's, I see an, an asymmetry here. Because if you signal something that, yeah, this is a work you can use, these are 
safe places where you can go and use materials, but if you're not there, you're operating at your own risk. I think that's all they should know. They, you can't educate people about fair use. You know, I've been teaching it for so many years, and I, I honestly have some questions I don't know how to answer. Uh, and courts don't want to give us answers because courts prefer to operate with a vague standard. They, you, you, you can't judge them if you don't know what the rules are. Yeah. I mean, Larry Lessig famously called it the right to hire a lawyer is all that fair use. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then one other thing I'll just throw on the table is there is an effort um, in certain sub-industries to come together and just agree what the fair use rules of the road should be, codes of conduct. So there's one for documentary filmmakers, there's one for social media. Some, some academics have criticized these efforts as overly reductionist, takes the fair out of fair use, but it allows you to say things like, you know, six minutes is okay in a documentary, nine minutes is not okay. Who knows if a judge is gonna embrace that, but it at least gets you kind of talking. So, Professor Reed. <clears throat> So thinking ahead to the spectrum panel and, and hopefully the water panel too, um, one of the knobs that I didn't hear discuss that I really wanted to hear your thoughts on um, is dispute resolution and remedies and enforcement, which is right. going to be a huge, a huge issue in spectrum and I, I imagine in water too. So I wonder if you might reflect on some themes in um, thing about interference, difficulties in determining infringement and thinking about remedies and thinking about statutory damages and thinking about notice and takedown, all of that kind of stuff. I'd That's a great question. That's curious a really good question, right? We have these rights contests about where your property ends and the public domain begins. Do we have the right institutions? Do we have the right procedures uh, to, to do this kind of thing, right? It's, it's mainly litigation in the world we're talking about with a lot of settlement and negotiation as well. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's not a new issue that the legal system is expensive. Litigation is, you know, outside of most people's budgets. And we're asking people to make risk determinations based on these nebulous concepts like fair use that then they could end up in litigation over. And the same thing in the trademark world. You're picking a mark and you're trying to decide, even with an attorney's help, whether it's available for you to use it. And on the patent side, the kind of the same thing comes up. And, and I don't know that, you know, that maybe that's the bigger issue to me of is there reform needed in our legal system and the way we resolve disputes. And as much as we put in ADR and mediation and requirements along those lines, not everybody really likes that either. So I think that is, you know, a world problem or a U.S. problem at least to be solved. I mean, you know, one other, in, a, in IP, there's a little bit more emphasis these days on administrative procedures. Mm -hmm. So Cristelli happens to be one of the, like, world's authorities on how music licensing rates get set in this kind of Byzantine way. Or in the patent world, the American Vents Act has really increased the role of the PTO as, I mean, is that different than litigation in meaningful ways? Is it helping us kind of get the more efficient result or the more just result? Um, or is it just litigation by other, by other means? Uh, well, that is, see, sounds pessimistic when you word it like that, but I guess it, prob it, I guess it probably is. I, you know, I, I as a scholar have, have some, some concerns with the way that we handle, you know, music licensing, speaking specifically, um, in part because um, we have a, a copyright royalty board that's basically doing rate setting. Um, and putting aside, you know, any sort of constitutional concerns around the authority vested in this in this agency to be doing it, and you know, a single rate court kind of judging that, putting that aside, even I think just from an economic perspective, the most interesting thing about this rate setting, and we, you know, if you if you listen to any of these hearings, you see people on both sides arguing, well, this rate is artificially low or it's super competitive. How the heck would we possibly know? <laughs> you know, um, the economists would say the 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 creation of the statutory license was simultaneous with this particular industry. So we don't know if the rates that Pandora is pushing are uh, it throwing its weight around or if the record labels, you know, crying that this is too low if they're, if they're whining or if they're right, right? We don't have an actual market for these. So my biggest concern is in, insofar as we, uh, we resort to rate setting to avoid these sort of, you know, negotiation and litigation problems. Um, it is arguably a, a bit of an arbitrary process because we, we honestly don't know if this is a representative market rate or not. Time for one more question, Neil. Why don't you wait for the mic? <clears throat> uh, I guess I'll start with just a, a rant about software patents and, and how they don't, they don't seem to 
relate to the constitutional basis for all of this. They don't uh, make, they, they don't serve the public. But my question really on copyright is around software. So uh, we talk about how there's a benefit. I mean, the whole reason we protect with, with copyright is so that uh, people will be able to publish things and be able to protect what they published. But people don't publish software. They copyright the object code, which is of little use to anyone. So can we reform copyright in such a way that uh, you're required to actually publish the thing that is useful for software developers for the world to learn about and uh, avoid this uh, really locking up software for uh, way beyond an infinity in, in an internet age? Yeah, I mean, and, and as I understand the issue, and, and I, I know there's a lot of discussion around this, right? Traditionally, we have this thing called the Library of Congress, and we send them two copies of our book. Um, and by the way, this has created one of the world's great libraries. But apparently, this doesn't apply in the software world. You can give them snippets or a little bit of object code. Um, and it's tied to the duration problem because your company is going to be out of business in a few years, right? So, so is that, and I guess it's connected to the last question, too. What role does that play in the public domain, right? Is that diminishing the public domain? It could play a huge role. And in a different context, I argue that this is exactly what should be done. By the way, publication was the standard, but we, yeah. we Congress thought that it's too taxing on creators. So uh, now we have fixation, which I don't like. But again, we should, I think, stop thinking about uniform solutions. So in, in the software space, it makes a lot of sense to add another screen or, you know, you want you want to get copyright protection first, it shouldn't be for life plus 70 or it shouldn't be for 120 years or 95 years. It should be for a much, much shorter period of time. And then I, I don't see why not, why shouldn't we add another uh, prerequisite that you, know, you need to satisfy in order to get protection in publication. I, what you said resonates well with me, uh, yeah. Any parting thoughts on this or anything else? We've got about 30 seconds. Anything to add? All right, well, we're about to give you a 15-minute break, but before we do that, please join me in thanking the panelists.